Let's sing it. Let our praise. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven, Lord. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. Yes, we are. It's been such a rich morning. I don't, I, uh, I'm just so grateful. You know, one of the things that was in my heart uh, when I became the pastor of this church many years ago uh, was that it would be a second generation church. So often parents are really dedicated, raise their kids, and the kids are disconnected from the church. It's mom and dad's church. But kids, this is children, young men, seniors. This is your church. You understand that? It is your church. And we, we have a role as adults, a little older, a little farther down the road, to lead and to provide example and be there for you. But um, your senior year doesn't come around again, nor does your junior year, nor your sophomore year, nor when you're 11 or when you're eight, all these things are God is adding step by step, stone by stone to you if you want it. And um, the scripture says to remember the creator in the days of your youth. And when I was uh, fairly new in the Lord, someone said to me that uh, if you're going to walk with God, he's going to break you. Can I get an amen and a goose bump on that? <laughs> Kevin, what are you talking about? He gives me parking places. He, he, <laughs> he, said, he said, he's going to break you one way or another. And I, he's either going to break you when you're young or he's going to break you when you're old. I said, well, I want him to break me when I'm young. And he did. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it will not bear fruit. And when you allow God to deal with you in depth, you, you encounter depth all through your life. And what Katina said this morning so joyfully, um, there are many people that lost a spouse that never get over it. They're not the same person. Life has ended. And whatever God did in you and is doing in you, and, and the two of you as well, losing your dad, 
My wife lost her dad when she was 10. Rhonda over here lost her parents when, before you were 11. Bill lost his parents when he was, when your, uh, your mom was 12. There's the people in here that have been through it, and you, it's, it's watching God's faithfulness in your life. It was so much. Uh, David, I want to say to you and Courtney, I'm exhausted watching the video. <laughs> I need to go home and take a nap after watching that. I can't, I mean, for some of you, when we were younger, we used to take like 100 kids to Mexico. And we'd drive down, i get in them all here. Saturday night, they'd come in and spend the night at the church from San Jose. We have about 100 kids and 20 adults and caravan. And Rhonda had shopped for food for three weeks. And we had trailers full of frozen food so that we'd eat when we got down there south of Ensenada. And uh, Sunday night would come. And I was, <clears throat> many a Sunday night, I said, how am I going to make it to Friday? You know, like David said, but then you watch God unfold. And um, Noah, that was a great presentation on your part. And uh, Trey as well. And I know others of you have things to say. And um, I saw this, I wrote this down. It's a story about Billy Graham. It was a Sunday before Christmas. He was walking down Highland Street in Mount Holly, North Carolina, when he, on his way to, uh, to see somebody in the church. And he, wanted, he needed to mail a package on his way, very, and it was urgent. So he asked a young boy where he could find the post office. When the boy had directed him, um, Reverend Graham thanked him and said, uh, if you come to church uh, this evening, you can hear me telling everyone how to get to heaven. The boy replied, I think I'll give your sermon a miss. If you don't even know the way to the post office, how will you lead me to heaven? <laughs> it's a great question, a practical question, an observational question. We don't know what we're doing when we're doing it. Some of the things some of you young people said up in the mountain to kids that were in other churches, you don't even know you said it. It's affected them. They're talking to a friend about some conversation you had. We can't keep track of it all. Um, I've shared this story before, but when I uh, was a young Christian, first came to the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit, I, I was very, very expressive to share about Jesus with whoever I It wasn't a program in the church. It wasn't like I had been to a class and said, this is what you do. It wasn't a pastor saying we need to share our faith. It was something that I couldn't stop speaking about what I had seen and heard. And so my a good friend uh, was with us, and um, they recognized something different was about, about me. But I started telling them him about Christ. I said, "Listen, he's the real deal. He's l- life makes no sense without Jesus." He's the son of God. He, he died for your sins. You understand? I mean, the person I was talking to at the time was just looking at me with that blank. Look, there is no purpose. If you don't deal with God, then what are you dealing with? If you don't trust God, who do you trust? And how does that work for you? And I was like almost this impassioned. And I started telling my own story. I can't believe what God, you know, all this stuff. And the person was still pushing back like so many people do. Yeah, yeah, well, that's good. Well, that's good for you. If you need a crutch, that's good for you. I get it. He's just talking to a guy that came out of 12 months of combat in Vietnam facing a very hostile enemy. I don't need a crutch. I need God. This was about three months afterwards, six months, seven months. Poor Dudley didn't know what to do with me. And anyway, as I, the person left, and I felt kind of bad, Oh, I came on too strong. How many of you ever felt bad about sharing your faith a certain way that you might have blown someone out of the water? Can I see your hands? How many have ever shared your faith? Well, good, everybody. A few of you didn't raise your hand. Um, and we are to share. You know, we'll share about a, a medicine that works. We'll share about 
a place we went, oh, this was a restaurant we love, or uh, we went on vacation, this is the greatest place, we'll share all about that. But it's not forcing it on people, but it should be part of us. So anyway, the long, to make a long story short, um, that person didn't come to Christ, but had, his girlfriend was there, standing next to him. I didn't even look at her, hardly. I mean, the whole time I was talking, and she was just standing there. And I, because I, I wasn't dealing with her. This person, other person, was very, um, I was very close to. And I hardly knew the other person. So as I, anyway, she came to Christ that night. I didn't direct any of my words towards her. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The passion I had was real. The lostness I felt in my friend, I was trying to communicate foundness. And I was, it was not just witnessing. It was more than that. And she somehow got in the glory spot. It went this way and went over this way. She became a very good friend and uh, she's still walking with the Lord 50 years later. Lives back in Virginia. Amazing. The gospel is good news. I want to, I don't, I had a, I want to continue with uh, spiritual warfare, but I don't want to cram a gallon into a quart jar here. We've had a full morning, and I'm going to just close with a few thoughts, and I'll pick that up next week. But the Lord will use you in spite of yourself. No matter how unspiritual you feel today, I wrote this down. <clears throat> Say this with me. I don't pray enough. I don't read enough. I don't give enough. <laughs> I don't share enough. I don't love enough. I don't care enough. Enough is not what it's about. Say it with me. It's about Jesus filling us with the Spirit for good works. We are going to always fall short at some point along the journey. That's why he washed the disciples' feet. He didn't reject them. He said, Peter said, uh, you can't do that. And he said, no, no, Peter, the feet. And he said, well, no. But I, he says, Peter, if you don't let me wash your feet, if you don't let me work with you on this journey and help tweak things along the way, you can't have any part of me. And he says, well, then throw the whole bucket on me. Paraphrase. Just get me totally. He says, you don't need that. You've already got me. He said, your feet need to be washed. So that's what we're about. God's washing our feet. And as a church, we come here and we hear an exhortation and we hear testimonies. And so we get edified for out there. And we carry that with us because, as we've said so often, this is the huddle. The game is out here. And many people think that the church is the huddle. They've got the best looking huddle in, in North America. It could have, you could have solid crystal on your walls. It's a beautiful huddle. But are you in the game? Am I in the game? Are we still in the game, regardless of age? And with that, are we still alive in him? And I want to say in closing, with spiritual warfare, the enemy will use every tactic he can to neutralize us, um, to limit us. Um, I once... It was, a, it was one of those mornings where you, you parents know these mornings, but many years ago, I, could, I couldn't find my keys. I was late. I was, going, I was supposed to be at a prayer meeting with about 20 pastors down in San Juan, and the kids were running late. Dudley was running late. We all, it was, a, it was one of those things, a critical, so believe it or not, I raised my voice. What's going on? You, you know, 
and, and then I remember I said to Dudley, I said, I'm going to a prayer meeting. <laughs> so I left. And I drive down San Juan, we go in, and this particular group of pastors were all older. They were all, well, my age now, but they were all older. I was in my early 40s, and they were going around praying around the circle. I'd like to pray for the African Inland Mission. We've been finding this. I'd been involved uh, with uh, the church in India. These guys were heavy hitters in their own sphere. And it got to me, and I said, uh, I had a fight with my wife this morning. And they go, they all kind of smirk. They all went, they've been there. I know they had. You go, and you know, I just had a bad attitude. So I just want to adjust that attitude. So they went around and kind of, so then afterwards, one of them, his name was Roy Brill, who, who went to Africa in 1930 um, and was in the African Inland Mission, really powerful guy. He grabs me. He comes, Kevin, come here. He said, listen, if, if the devil can't get you to go after another woman, and if the devil can't get you to steal from the church, he's perfectly happy in neutralizing your marriage. That's all he said. And I said, thanks, Roy. No, <laughs> no I didn't. I, I thought about it because we think we think that the marriage, it's, a, it's adultery or it's, you know, crimes. And that's the big thing. But it's the little foxes in our life that spoil the vine. And it's the maintenance in our marriage, the maintenance in our friendships, the maintenance in our children day by day that makes a difference. And then we have high water marks like this retreat. So very grateful for that. It's been a uh, thank you so much. When do you go back to Texas? Tuesday. Good. Well, Lord, bless him, and uh, God, I'm so glad that you're, you're doing well. And uh, Pat, come on up. The sin runs deep, the grace is, the grace is found, is where you are. 